Here we're looking at Roger van der Weyden's Last Judgment, which was painted from the late 1440s to the early 1450s. It's a very large painting, about 7 feet tall and over 18 feet wide. That is big. It's very big, and as we can see, it's a uh, polyptych. It's made out of several different panels that were meant to be folded closed when the altarpiece was not meant to be viewed, when it wasn't the mass wasn't being performed or when it didn't need to be viewed for other reasons. And it was had a, it was made for a special location. That's right. It was behind the altar of a hospital uh, chapel in uh, Bonn, France, uh, currently France, and it is um, meant to be seen by the people who were in the hospital, and we need to remember that those people weren't there to get better. Uh, hospitals in this period were where people went to die. Not and, where they went to get better. Right. So they were really looking at this as perhaps something, you know, that they were going to face sort of imminently. Right, exactly. Know, this decision about where they ended up for eternity. Mm -hmm. And so here we have a kind of typical subject that we see really often in art history of the Last Judgment. It's this terrifying subject that comes down to us from the medieval. Um, and and the, the issue of the immediacy, I think, is is incredibly important. Also, the fact that I think if it would be opened, it would it would never lose, in a sense, its impact. No. And uh, part of the impact has to do with Roger van der Weyden's particular way of painting within the Flemish tradition. I mean, on the one hand, it's typically 15th century Flemish with its elongated figures, abundant fabric, with its paper-like geometric folds, the incredible attention to texture and detail and, and clarity, of, clarity yeah. of lighting. Yeah. But then it's uniquely his own work because of the very, very shallow space which all the figures are confined within. And as we're going to see in some of the details, a great emotional, dramatic Right, that rendering. emphasis on emotion, which, which actually Michelangelo, nearly 100 years later, said that Roger van der Weyden made works of art specifically for old people and women. Right, because, they because were, of its sense of drama. Its sense of drama and, and interest in the emotional and the dramatically emotional. You know, the, the sense of the dramatic is interesting because there's almost actually something operatic about this. If you look at the the way in which, um, how, how would you describe that? Is that a kind of cloud? Is that a kind well, of... Well, yeah. what we see is uh, Christ with the court of heaven. Uh, he's surrounded by various saints, including the Virgin Mary, below and to the uh, left, to his right. Um, and then immediately below him is uh, the Archangel Michael. Why don't we take a look at the center panel, and what we can see is the main part of the narrative. It's the end of time. Uh, Christ has appeared in this glorious vision with the court of heaven. He's accompanied by angels who are blowing very, very loud trumpets that have woken up the dead. We see them crawling up out of their graves on the bottom. And now Christ is sitting in judgment uh, with the archangel Michael, who's holding scales, weighing souls. Mm. Um, we always need to remember that the saved are always on Christ's right, which is the viewer's left, and the damned are always on Christ's right. left, so Christ which is our right. Separates the blessed from exactly. the damned on this day of judgment, and he's you're right. He's like you know the figures in this court of heaven have this gold cloud behind them, and then he seems to sit on this rainbow. Right, and so there's something simultaneously very otherworldly and spiritual about that, but also the way van der Weyden's painted his clothes, it's like it's a wooden bench. I mean, Christ is very rationally <laughs> his, sitting on a rainbow. His drapery <laughs> draped over that it's bench. It's a kind of literalism yeah. um, that is so much a part of that northern tradition, and we can see that especially in the way that the souls are, are coming out of their graves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And we can tell that I mean, we always know where the saved and the damned are relative to them, but even in this narrative it's clear because we see the scale that Michael is holding. The person to Christ's left, our right, is heavy with sin, and so that side of the scale is weighing down And he more. looks worried, that he little man. He looks worried, typical of van der Weyden's representation of uh, emotional, dramatic qualities, but notice how Christ and Michael are not emotional at all. Uh, that's because they're judges. They need to be neutral. They need to be indifferent. They are perfectly um, frontal. And, yes. yep. and, and in, centered. In, and in no way are they attending to either the blessed or the damned. Right, and it's too late for mercy. As you can see, the people mm -hmm. on, the side of the sa uh, on the side of the sinners are begging for. Uh, but you can tell by Christ and Michael's expressions that there's no time for that anymore. Right, it's too late. And, you know, look at, look at Michael's robe. I mean, the fabulous the gold embroidery and the brooch that he's wearing. But also a kind of really extraordinary elegance that, mm -hmm. that imparts a kind of authority, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is very much uh, purposeful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, down at the very bottom of the whole painting, 
on the left are those saved running off into heaven, but maybe much more interesting are the sinners who are rushing off into hell. Um, here's a detail Aren't of some of those figures on the They're bottom. Fantastic. Remember that uh, as this is an altarpiece, it would have been raised up relatively high, and so the figures that are on the very bottom are actually the most visible and conspicuous in the whole painting. And so here we see figures uh, that are rushing off to hell. We see the very typical van der Weyden representation of uh, emotions and anguish. My favorite is the guy standing in the back with clenched fists who's really, <laughs> really upset about going to hell. Um, and it, there's also... A, it doesn't seem right to laugh. No, <laughs> no it's just awful. But there's also important subtleties here uh, related to theology and ideas of free will and how you end mm -hmm. up a sinner because notice how these sinners, they're not going to hell by being pulled down by demons or thrown or down by directly. angels or pushed by any kind of monster. They're getting there on their own. Uh, the guy that I mentioned before who's clenching his fists, he's just running. Yeah. Uh, and the people in front of him, they are too, although here we can see that they're pulling each other down. Look at the person on the bottom who reaches up and grabs that woman's hair to yank her down. There's a lesson here. The, the lesson is that you end up a sinner, you end up in hell because you get there yourself or you allow others to literally pull you down with them. Uh, and this painting is a clear e explanation of that mm -hmm. kind of theological of point. human free will. Interesting. Yeah. I think we have another detail. Of the uh, sinners. Yeah, here we are on the extreme right edge of the painting, and here they are now tumbling down into hell. Into the fires of hell. This is really supposed to strike fear into the heart of the viewer. And again, put yourself in the mind of someone who's sick and dying in this hospital. Mm -hmm. The point is to encourage someone like that to... To repent. To repent, to, to ask confess, for forgiveness, right. to, to live their last days as a good Christian in order to avoid these horrible punishments. Right. This, this notion of balance is really interesting, sort of the extremity uh, that we see here. I'm also just really interested in the invented landscape, which mm -hmm. is, which is uh, I think, really quite beautiful and, um, and just sort of terrible in the contrast of human flesh against these stones, against, yeah. this, against this fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I'm wondering, is in the north, would people have been reading Dante? Would that have been something that would have would have brought um, these ideas to the fore and sort of given a kind of given a kind of physical shape uh, to the way in which hell was understood. I don't know if Dante was yeah. read up for. I'm, I'm, well, not, I'm not sure that whether it, it was actually read by the people in upper class society, like this patron would have been, or if the kind of imagery that Dante creates mm -hmm. in his texts has by now become right. current Inculcated, in imagery yeah. from right. the period that's made its way up from Italy. Uh, but certainly it is that kind of, it's that genre of imagery of hell that um, people would have been familiar with either in general or specifically from the text. True, and then, you know what's so interesting, as you move away from Michael, where we have a representation of the human form as beautiful and perfect, um, and then we see the figures that are literally running to hell, um, mm -hmm. where we begin to see a kind of human distortion, to here, where we see a real uh, deformation of the human body. It is this sort of... This kind of jumble of limbs. It is, but this increasing sense of the grotesque mm -hmm. as the human body is, is sort of brought away from grace. From the divine. Yeah.